Our scripture passage today comes from the second chapter of Acts, beginning with the first verse. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages. As the Spirit gave them the ability. Now they were devout Jews from every people under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said they are filled with new wine. This is the word of the Lord. Man, that's got a lot, of, a lot of hard Bible words in it. So hats off to Sean for doing that. Give her a big round of applause, yeah. Jeez. I didn't figure out how to pronounce those words until I was in my last year of seminary, so um, I'm always in awe. Yeah, big fan at the Pentecost Festival uh, over in the Palm Center. Go straight across the campus. Mengi will kind of lead you out after the service where we'll have lots of good food. That's the first thing you always say to a Presbyterian crowd. Lots of good food. Uh, save the expense on breakfast or brunch. Come on over. Have a good amount of food. And then this wonderful display of people's creative gifts and talents. Um, and I went over there and it's really amazing the wide variety of uh, skills and talents that people have. So go on over, take a look, and enjoy some fellowship. And while you're there, take a peek in the back, because we are almost done with our um, back, what we call our back 40 pathway. Uh, we have this wonderful trail that goes a half mile around the back of our property, around the lake that ends up in this beautiful labyrinth that you can use for spiritual reflection and meditation. And so take a peek over there. You can walk on it if you'd like. Uh, more to be done. There's some landscaping that needs to be done and some park benches and stuff like that. But feel free to go over and take a look at that. We're very excited about that project as well. So let us pray. Lord, thank you for your word. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the gift of your spirit. And we thank you for this story and pray that through this story we may discover more of how you are at work even now in this world. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Some of you have heard me tell the story of years and years ago when I was in California visiting a good friend of mine. Tim was pastoring a church north of Los Angeles right there on the Pacific Coast. And while I was there, Tim received an invitation from one of his parishioners for us to go sailing. Now, I am not much of a sailor. I've been out a few times, but I grew up in the lake, and the idea of a little, you know, pleasure cruise on the Pacific Ocean sounded pretty good. So late that afternoon, Tim and I made our way over to the man's house, whose name was Bob, and there behind Bob's house was this beautiful 36-foot sailboat. Now, it turned out there were going to be four of us on this little pleasure cruise, and uh, Two of us knew something about sailing, two of us didn't, and I was in the latter category. So we got on the boat, checked some of the last minute things, untied the lines, and off we went. Now in order to get out to the ocean, we had to pass through a few canals, and then finally into the harbor, and then finally out into the ocean. Now before we started out, I didn't realize how windy it was. It seemed that with each passing minute though, as we got closer to the ocean, no mistake that the wind got windier and windier. And then all of a sudden, Bob, the captain, shouted, I shouted out, Gentlemen, let's prepare to race. Race? I didn't know we were racing. 
Nobody's saying to me about racing. This was going to be a pleasure cruise. I was ready for the cheese and crackers. I was ready to stretch out and catch what little tan I could ever catch. But before I knew it, the sails were up, the engine was off, the wind was getting windier, the waves were getting wa wavier, and now I remember that I'm not a sailor. And so off we go into the harbor, and we did that whole jockeying for the start thing, and then out under the ocean with the boat going this way and the boat going that way, giving new meaning to the phrase, keel over... And as with the waves seemed to be tossing us around at their whim, and as Captain Bob was barking out orders with a voice that betrayed a little bit of panic, and as it was all that I could do to hold on to the lines which held on to the sails, which held on to the wind, which was driving us further into the, into the ocean, it was then that I began to think, what a wonderful life I've lived. <laughs> now, we were on that ocean for three hours, and it took me about the first hour to realize that we were probably not going to die, underlying probably. It wasn't until well into the race, with the ocean spray in our face, the wind whipping us around, and the boom swinging back and forth, almost knocking my head off a couple of times, it wasn't until then that I began to realize that maybe I wasn't at the end of my life, maybe this was sailing. That this is what happens when you put into the deep and you raise your sails and you let the wind take you. We finished the race dead last, so you need to ask me to mention that too. But without the wind, sailing is not much fun. If you don't have the wind, it doesn't feel much like sailing, which may have been something important to keep in mind when we celebrate this day, this day called Pentecost. Pentecost, among many things, was a wind event. At least that's what Luke would have us understand. Last week, we reflected on the ascension of Jesus and Jesus handing the keys to the kingdom to the disciples, telling them it was their turn to drive. And his command was to wait for the Holy Spirit. Wait for the Holy Spirit, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. You become the church when the Holy Spirit comes. Not that the Holy Spirit hasn't been around. We saw the Spirit descending upon Jesus like a dove at his baptism. We saw Jesus being led by the Spirit into the wilderness. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, has been around since the very beginning. But there comes a time when the Spirit is manifested in an unmistakable way. And on Pentecost, the Spirit comes with the rush of a mighty wind. Tongues as a fire and the rush of a mighty wind. The Spirit was moving, and the Spirit was moving these men, filling their sails and dancing them across the white cap. They may have had a little taste of it when a while back they were taking a little jaunt across the Galilean Sea, these disciples, and Scripture tells us that the wind picked up. Jesus was in the boat, and the wind picked up. What, what a wonderful way of thinking about the church, this group of people who have Jesus with them, and the wind is picking up. I will be with you always, Jesus says, and oh, by the way, the wind is going to pick up. Not much fun being the church if you've got no wind. So the wind comes to these disciples in their little hideaway, and as the story goes, these uncertain men get blown out of their little room and into the streets, and they begin speaking in ways that can be understood by a whole kaleidoscope of people. So strange is this wind event, so chaotic is this manifestation of the Spirit that folks think that maybe these guys have gotten into the wine cellar uncorked a few bottles. It's the kind of thing that might happen when the wind comes. He or she might cause us to act a little bit out of our minds, which may explain why us Presbyterians have always had a little bit of an arm's length thing going with Pentecost. Historically, we Presbyterians have been the cerebral types. This idea of being a little bit out of our minds is not a very comfortable thought. We like reason. We like common sense. We like things done decently and in order. We like agendas and minutes. We like budgets. We like Robert's rules of order. We're not much into wind. We're not much into acting out of our minds. We don't like chaos. 
the kind of chaos the wind brings. But when there is no wind, there is no church. The Bible over and over again makes this point. When Peter has a dream in which the Spirit prompts him to set sail for Caesarea up the coast because there was a Roman centurion there and his family that needed him. Peter set sail, took the wind, and went north to Caesarea, entered the home of a Gentile Roman army general, and they two speak back and forth in languages they can understand, and then the Spirit blows like the rush of a mighty wind, and Peter feels moved, because that's what the Spirit does, moves you. Peter feels moved to baptize this Gentile, Roman, general, and his family. And the decently in an order guys say, you can't do that. We're Jewish, remember? We pass no motion. There is no mention in the minutes that we can go ahead and baptize Gentiles. And it causes quite a stir when the Spirit blows Peter past the previous code of conduct, the previous rules and regulations. But when there is no Spirit, when there is no wind, there is no church. When the old prophet says that what the Lord doth require of us is to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God, which has been our theme throughout this whole year, he had to have known how hard it would be for us to figure that out. He had to have known what mischief that might create. He had to have known that when Jesus attempted to interpret this vision and wave that banner, for Jesus it would mean reaching out to all the folks that everybody else was saying yuck to. He was reaching out to all the folks that everybody was saying yuck to. The prostitutes, the lepers, the unclean, the tax collectors, the people of a different party, the people of a different opinion. What was Jesus thinking? Was he out of his mind? Perhaps. Doing something like that can end you up on a cross. But the Spirit takes us to the stormy seas sometimes. The wind whips up the waves and sometimes even puts the ship at risk. What was William Wilberforce thinking, the 19th century member of the British Parliament and abolitionist? What was he thinking when he stood up against the deeply ingrained institution of slavery and led the movement to tear it down? Was he out of his mind? Had he broken into the wine cellar? Or had the wind picked up? Was Jesus in the boat? And the wind picked up. It's not often when Pentecost falls on Memorial Day weekend. So when it does, it's important, I suppose, to pay attention to what those days might mean side by side. Tomorrow you will find me, as you will every Memorial Day, walking amidst the markers of the National Cemetery in Sarasota giving thanks for the men and women who gave a portion of their lives to our country, some who gave the supreme sacrifice of their lives. It's a sacred place there, this garden of devotion, these lives of men and women who sacrificed to a cause greater to them than, than themselves. They lived and some died for freedom. And above this garden, these fellow citizens who have preceded us in death, above these veterans, a half-mast flag will hang, billowed by the wind, our national banner swelled and swirled by a breeze we cannot see. As Christians, we know that for us, this banner of liberty and justice is billowed by a certain wind, an unmeteorological wind, the wind of the Holy Spirit. We pursue liberty and justice as only the Spirit would move us to such liberty and justice. Our freedom is in the Spirit. 
Paul says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And so we pursue the spirit's liberty, the spirit's justice, do justice, love kindness, walk humbly. And if for Peter it meant the Gentile general, and if for Jesus it meant the lawbreakers and the morally suspect, and if for William Wilberforce it meant the slave, if for all of them it meant some human being or human beings who felt outside the boat, outside the Jesus boat, then, well then, who might this wild and windy spirit be moving us toward? Years ago, with another church, I had several opportunities to visit the Copan region of Honduras on the other side of the country from where we go as Church of the Palms. We partnered there with some brothers and sisters in Christ providing health care and schooling for children. One night in one of the trips when we were there, in the wee hours of the night, a knock came to my door. It was the leader of our group there to tell me that a visitor was asking for help a few of us gathered and went down to the lobby, and there sat a young, very pregnant mother and her infant and her toddler. Through an interpreter, we learned her story, that they were living with an abusive husband and father, and they feared for their lives. They were penniless, had only the clothes on their backs, and they were fleeing. They had family on the other side of the country, but they didn't have a bus ticket or money for food for the clandestine journey. This young mother was all alone, a desperate fellow human being caring for the brood of innocent children. Our little group huddled together to discuss what we could do. The things we did not discuss were immigration policy or theories on the nuclear family, or the rights and wrongs of divorce, or the philosophy behind monetary aid. What we discussed was four scared and sacred human beings. Did you know that the words scared and sacred have the same letters? Scared and sacred human beings fleeing for their lives who felt very outside the love of Jesus. So the wind picked up, and we hid them in our rooms and for the rest of the night, and we chipped in for bus fare and food, and we surrounded them and walked them to the station and put them, put them on their first rickety bus to freedom. Nothing real courageous about that, but the eyes of that mother and those children, it was those eyes that reminded us of the humanness and it was the humanness where the spirit got us. And we were moved. And maybe that's where the spirit will always get us. In the eyes and faces of all the children of God, those inside the boat and those outside. And the spirit moves us. And we dare to hoist our sails. We dare to put out into the deep. We dare to hold on to the lines that hold the sails. And we dare to remember that Jesus is in the boat. And we dare to worry less about ourselves and more about the other. And now we're sailing. We are doing what we were being called to do from the very beginning. And sometimes it's crazy. And sometimes we seem out of our minds. And sometimes we may go way beyond the boundary. But that's bound to happen when you've got Jesus in the boat and the wind picks up. Blow, Holy Spirit. Blow, move us out of our comforts and our hiding places and remind us of Jesus. Take us out of our minds so we can discover the joy of our master, the joy when all find their liberty and justice, when all will discover what was true all along, that all of us, every single one of us, is a child of God. Because when there is no wind, there is no church. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you on this Pentecost Sunday that you blew your spirit in us and through us and that you moved us into the world and you keep blowing your spirit. You keep moving us into the world. You keep reminding us again that Jesus is in the boat and you keep helping us to see the eyes and the faces of all your children. Amen.